Welcome, everybody, to Adapter Parish, Episode 61, The Absent-Minded Professor and Flubber. Before class starts, let's talk about our next episode. We've tackled some pretty extensive topics here on the show. We've looked at eight versions of Jane Eyre. We've looked at 11 versions of Dracula. We've looked at 15 versions of Sherlock Holmes. And over our next two episodes, we will be examining 16 versions of the world's most famous outlaw, Robin Hood. We'll be hitting all the most well-known versions, and we'll be looking at some lesser-known versions along the way, and we can promise plenty of pleasant and unpleasant surprises along the way as well. That begins in two weeks on Tuesday, March 10th, and continuing two weeks later on March 24th. We genuinely can't wait. If you have any comments, questions, or corrections about today's episode that you'd like to hear on the show, remember to email adapterparishcast at gmail.com or tweet at us using the adaptcast hashtag. If you enjoy the show, we'd love it if you would share that with the world by leaving a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Show notes from this and all other episodes can be found at adapterparishcast.com. And with that, on with the show, Adapter Parish, Episode 61, The Absent-Minded Professor and Flubber. Hello and welcome to Adapter Parish, a podcast about adaptation. I'm Jeremy Latour. And I'm Arielle Lipshaw. And today we will be discussing the 1961 film, The Absent-Minded Professor, and its 1997 remake titled Flubber. Yes, they went they went simple for the second they one. They went simple. And this is Straight not... Straight to the point. Yes, not the nutty professor. The no. absent-minded professor. It's well, just a totally different professor. God, the odds of me saying the nutty professor are high yeah, in yeah. this episode. Yeah. Like when I was titling it, I had to you know, I create the create the file and I title it and everything. I definitely titled it the nutty professor. It's not the nutty professor. And I fixed it. Nor is it Dr. Doolittle. No, it's not. It's the absent-minded not. professor. Right. Yes. Um. Th- I mean, I feel like we can just jump straight in. Yeah. So did you ever see any either of these movies? I definitely never saw the 19. 19- 61 movie i may have seen flubber i mean i'm pretty familiar with robin williams's mid 90s oeuvre yeah um i don't specifically remember seeing it but it would not surprise me if i had i'm pretty positive i was the reverse yeah i definitely never saw flubber gotcha. but i i'm pretty sure i saw the absent-minded professor when i was a kid gotcha i feel like these like live action 60s disney movies have come up on the show before i mean we did mary poppins yeah. and we talked about that a lot but like what was your did you see like the lesser ones no like no. the shaggy dog no uh, no, and did you ever I had seen the Snowball Express. No, absolutely not. And I had never seen Pete's Dragon, as you know. Right. Um. No, you definitely grew up watching movies that were not our thing I in our house. I love them, like that darn cat, the cat from outer space. No, we were like '90s Disney all the way. Uh, okay. Yeah. They, they these were great. Yeah. This was like a fun era of just. Oh, well, I mean, we'll get to it, but I feel like. Uh, you know, I've said this on the show before that like the secret to Disney animation was consistency. Mm-hmm. Like that was the thing that made them great was that you could watch it. And it would be consistent from beginning to end. Right. Um, I feel like that's true for their live action ones, too. Like, I'm not saying they were the most incredible movies ever made. Sure, sure, sure. But they're really consistent well, from they, beginning to end. Yeah. And they also like essentially had like a repertory cast. You know yeah. what I mean? Like there were a bunch of people like Ed Wynn is in this movie mm-hmm. and he's in Mary Poppins. Yep. He's in a ton of stuff. The little girl from Mary Poppins was in a bunch of other Disney movies. She's in That Darn Cat and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, they had essentially a repertory company. So if you like one, you're probably going to like them all is what I'm saying. I feel like this would be a good way to kind of talk about the 1961 movie because let's talk a little bit before we talk about what it's about okay let's talk about who made it great so this was directed by robert stevenson and written by bill walsh there you go robert stevenson this is his 17th appearance on this show <laughs> at least 17 uh, his 205th appearance on this show what a career this guy has had <laughs> it really is amazing so i'm just going to run through a list of movies that were not only directed by robert stevenson but written by bill walsh okay who wrote the absent-minded professor sounds good the absent-minded professor mm-hmm son of flubber which is the sequel that we're not going to talk about right because that best i can see like no part of that really made its way into flubber in any big way gotcha uh the misadventures of merlin jones okay did you ever see that one nope never heard of that until this moment very good one uh mary poppins i have heard of that film uh that darn cat yes just mentioned that blackbeard's ghost 
Okay. The Love Bug. Okay. Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. Oh, I love that movie. And Herbie Rides Again. Gotcha. Herbie Rides Again is going to come up in a minute as well <laughs> okay. for another reason. But like, what What an oof. Just that these two guys worked on <laughs> together. That's pretty great. I'm not even mentioning the stuff that they did without each other. Because yeah. there are equally recognizable things on that list. Mm-hmm. But that that's pretty amazing. And this brings me to another thing. If we're talking about Bill Walsh, who wrote this, I'm not sure where this story came from. Because it seems to have come from two different places. Mm -hmm. Uh, We did a little research beforehand. Do you remember what the short story is called? I do not remember what it is called. That's okay, because we couldn't find it It, and didn't read it. It does not appear to be extant. Yeah, it's called A Situation of Gravity. Yes. It's a 1922 short story by Samuel W. Taylor published in Liberty magazine. Yeah, so I couldn't find I couldn't find the text of it anywhere. I couldn't find like any archives of this Liberty magazine anywhere. It probably exists like in some archive physically, but I I could not find it online. So, I'm going to engage in some wild speculation. Okay. Which well, I feel like 5 minutes into the episode wild speculation doesn't usually show up. No, it usually takes us much longer. I have no information about this short story. Okay. But because it's called a situation of gravity, mm-hmm. I'm assuming that the only real thing that in this story that ended up in the movie is the flubber. Yeah, that would be my guess. The flying rubber itself. Yes. And the reason I think that, I don't think that this had a lot to do with the characters because apparently, this is the other story that that kind of went into its creation. Apparently, a lot of this came from a real professor who taught at Princeton. Uh Uh-huh. His real name is important. His nickname is more important. Okay. His real name was Hubert Aaliyah. His nickname is Dr. Boom. (laughs) And he got that nickname (laughs) because of his explosive demonstrations. Apparently, he was super, super fun. The cool thing about this is he uh, he passed away in the 80s, but some of his talks, his later talks, were captured on film and video, and you can see them on YouTube. Oh, that's fun. So I'm going to link to one of them. I watched a little bit of it. He's a character. That's fun. And apparently, this is the story. So apparently, at the Brussels World's Fair in the 1950s, at one of them, um, Disney was there, Walt Disney himself, and he met Aaliyah at the International Science Pavilion and saw him do a demonstration. And then Disney told him that he'd given him an idea for a movie and invited him to California to give a demonstration for Fred McMurray, who went on to play uh, Ned Brainerd, the main character in The Absent-Minded Professor. Gotcha. So, like, A... We are told it's based on a short story, but we can't read the short story, so we don't know what made it in. Right. And B, there's this potentially apocryphal story about it being based on a real guy, but I can't find anything to back that up either. Gotcha. So here we are. Here we are. This movie is created, and I feel like that's okay because here's the deal. I think this movie is really an invention of Bill Walsh and Robert Stevenson. Yeah. I think that this is just what they did. Yeah. Is that fair? Would you say that's fair to say? I think that's totally fair. Like, you can be inspired by something without necessarily needing to classify it specifically as an adaptation. Like, I would have enjoyed reading the short story, but we could not find it. Yeah. It did not seem to be anywhere. Yeah. But anyway, I would recommend checking out Dr. Boom. He's (laughs) super fun. Great. Do you want to talk about this movie? Yeah. Now, in lieu of Back of the Box, because we don't have a box for this. I want to mention what this episode is brought to us by. Okay. This episode is brought to you <laughs> brought to you by Disney Plus. Yes. Uh, because both the movies that we watched are on Disney Plus. We are absolutely subscribers to that. That is true. Um, so I have the description of the absent-minded professor from the Disney Plus listing for that movie. And I'm going to pass it over to you so that you can read it. All right. A bumbling professor invents gravity-defying flubber. Thanks, Disney Plus. Thanks, Disney Plus. You did a great job. I mean, that is an accurate summary of the film. There's, I feel, I feel like there's a lot that it leaves out. It does, but some like, of the other characters, some of the rest of the story. That's definitely a thing that happens in this movie. I mean, I can't think of anything else that is as major in this movie as that. Yes. So let's go with that. Okay. Cool. Do you want to start us off? Yeah. So the curtain opens on an absent-minded professor and his <laughs> dog. <laughs> The dog is a major character, yep. Um, and he's always very careful to keep the dog safe. Yep. He, there's a seatbelt for the dog. Mm-hmm. Do you remember um, the dog's name? No. Charlie. Charlie. It's Charlie. He says Charlie all the he time. He says Charlie all the time. Yeah, Charlie's in, an exposition machine. Yeah. In fact, he uses the dog's name a lot when he's talking. Yeah. Um, He is doing some experiment in his garage. It explodes. Yep. This is Professor Ned Brainerd of, was it Medfield? Medfield College. Medfield College. And the other one was... Rutland. Rutland. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was going to say, it started with an R. Mm-hmm. I have a child. I don't remember anything. Uh, I don't remember anything that I didn't write down. His housekeeper comes in and says, you know, don't forget, Professor, you know, you have that very important date tonight. And it turns out that the place he is supposed to be is his own wedding. Mm-hmm. 
because the first two times they tried to have a wedding, he forgot. So this is his last chance to show up at his own wedding. Who's he getting married to? He's getting married to a lady named Betsy Carlisle. Mm -hmm. She uh, was in the movie Airport 1975. (laughs) (laughs) And she is the secretary to the president of the college. And we know that because he, in a very jolly manner, says to her, I'm sick and tired of having a spinster for a secretary. That is a line from this film. It is great. It's great. It's great. It's not problematic at all. Nope. Nope. Um, And spoiler alert, he does not show up for the wedding because he manages to accidentally invent a substance, which he calls flying rubber or flubber. Yeah. Yeah. And it blows up. It blows up. And he wakes up the next morning. He wakes up the next morning. How many times has he forgotten to go to the wedding, by the way? This is now the third. Yes. Yes, the third time. Which is too many times. Too many times. And blah, 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 hijinks ensue. (laughs) There's a villain and there's people trying to get their hands on Flubber and then he makes up with his girlfriend and they fly in his flying car to Washington, D.C. and almost get shot down. But then everything's fine and they all live happily ever after the end. That's basically it. Yeah. I mean, I feel like with any of these Disney movies, the plot isn't really the thing that draws you to it. No. It's the it's the comedy. It's the environment they create. It's the characters. That's right. It really is. I mean, I actually really like the characters in this movie. Yeah. I mean, the girlfriend endeared herself to me basically immediately because i thought they were presenting her in a really sympathetic light like Mm -hmm. she wasn't like a shrieking harpy like it is very unreasonable to be engaged to somebody who forgets your wedding for the third time and she calls it (laughs) i just love how mature she was about calling it off like she comes downstairs she's in her wedding dress her friends and family are gathered around he is not there and she just says well um i'm really sorry I guess this isn't happening. I I do apologize. I'll be sending back all of your gifts. And thank you for coming. Like, it's an extremely mature way of calling off a wedding. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I liked her for that. That's good. And then she just uh, she just gets gets on with it. She's back at work the next day. You know, her her um her boss is like, do you want to take a break? And she's like, no, no, I got to get back into it. Like, gotta gotta catch myself another man. Plus, there's that other man that's like waiting in the wings. Oh yeah, so that Professor Shelby Ashton from yes, Rutland from Rutland teaches Rut- teaches English. Yes, at the Evil College. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, there's multiple bad guys. I don't know. I feel like this this movie has like degrees of antagonist. Yeah. He's the minor antagonist. Yeah. But we do have a major antagonist. Yes. And then son of major antagonist. Right. Um, so Flubber. Yes. Let's, let's talk about Flubber. Let's talk about what it is. It is a substance that we are told creates its own energy. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have... I'm going to get this wrong. <laughs> yeah, do science. It Why do, don't you do some science right now, It sweetie? has like the opposite of inertia. So like if, the, if you bounce it, if you make a ball of it and you bounce it, you know how usually you bounce a rubber ball and it gets the bounces get less and less until it finally stops? Flubber does the opposite. The bounces get higher and higher because it's creating its own energy. You would say that its motion is perpetual perpetual motion it Uh is a perpetual motion what's the line from the simpsons we obey the laws of physics in this house yes it does not it does not do that so that's why he's very excited because he thinks he's made a major discovery well can we talk about the science for a second sure i want to dig on on this because there's another level of this that i love so much so we've already talked about how ned brainerd fred mcmurray is explaining all of this we learn about everything because he's explaining it to the dog yes which a is great yes the science is bullshit yeah but it's the type of bullshit science that is so endearing and one of the things I love about it is that if you were to remove everything except for the science talk, this could easily be like a horror movie from the 50s. Yeah. Like easily. Yeah, it's like the thing. It's exactly the same because he creates the flubber. And then what he finds out is that if you bombard it with gamma radiation, it will, that you can give it more energy and yeah. you can control it. This is how he makes his flying car. And Yes, yes. But like, what if it became sentient? You know what I mean? Then it would be a horror movie. I mean, those are the, that's the important questions. That yeah. would, if the flubber was sentient, that would absolutely be a horror movie. Yes. But the flubber doesn't become sentient, no. so we have nothing to worry about. Absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. Never. Uh, so that, I loved the science in this movie. It's yeah. just bullshit and fun and great. Yes. Characters. Well, Professor Brainerd works for Medfield College. Medfield College has a problem. They have the shortest basketball team in the world. I mean, that's one of their problems. They also have no money. They have no money and a very short basketball team. So Professor Brainerd comes up with the idea that he's going to put Flubber on the shoes of all of the basketball players for the big game with Rutland College, who has the tallest basketball team in the world, and they're going to win the game. I feel like this movie has like three set pieces. Yeah. Let me, can I walk through them for a second? Yes. So there's the basketball game. Yeah. As you've mentioned, there is the 
<laughs> there is his attempted murder of the <laughs> professor from Rutland, <laughs> right. and then there is the Washington D.C. flight. Right? Would you agree? Like, that, yeah, those are like the pieces of. Those are the pieces of action that happen in this movie. Yeah. And so you're you're going right to the to the basketball one. Yeah. Can I back up for one second? Yes, though? you can. I because there's other characters that we have now met at this point that I think are important to talk about. Okay. I mentioned like primary antagonist and son of primary antagonist. Right. So the primary antagonist is Alonzo P. Hawk. Right. Who's played by Keenan Wynn. Mm-hmm. There are two interesting things that I want to say that well, things that I found interesting. One, Keenan Wynn's fucking great. He is Ed Wynn's son. Yes. So we have and apparently Keenan Wynn's son is also in the movie. Oh, that's so nice. there's like three generations of ah, wins in this movie, which very is sweet. delightful. Alonzo P. Hawk also appeared in two other Disney movies. One of them I think will not be surprising, and the other one might be. Uh, so he appeared in Son of Flubber. Of course he did. It's not surprising. He's also in Herbie Rides Again. Just for funsies? Like, I don't I don't see why you wouldn't do that. <laughs> he's and that Keenan Wynn is like he's one of my favorite like Disney actors from this time. Uh-huh. I mentioned the Snowball Express before. He's the bad guy in that one. Yeah. Snowball Express is fucking great. Yeah. It's like we bought a slope. Like family buys a sled- skiing slope. Gotcha. It's a whole thing. Gotcha. That's the whole movie. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so Alonzo P. Hawk is the bad guy. He is rich. He's a businessman. He's a rich businessman, and his son goes to Medfield College. Yeah. And he's the star of the basketball team, except he's not playing in the big game because he's been suspended because he failed Professor Brainerd's class. Mm -hmm. Even though Professor Brainerd offered him extra help and all that jazz, he did not. He did not want to go to science class. Do you feel like this is underselling it if I were to say that Biff Hawk, (laughs) Alonzo P. Hawk's son, was maybe the most interesting character in the movie for us as we were watching it. Well, <laughs> I just want to I just want to paint a picture. Okay. We're watching this movie and often when we're watching movies um for this Jeremy is also on his phone because he's looking up information about like the actors in the movie and all that stuff. And I said, "Who who is this who is this guy? Who's this actor?" And Jeremy's looking at his phone and he goes, "Oh, Oh, no. And usually when he says that, it's because, like, the person died tragically, like, (laughs) the next year or something. And I was like, oh, God, what happened? And he goes, (laughs) he goes, oh, he's the kid who had to shoot old Yeller. (laughs) So that was a bummer. So that was a bummer. Also directed by Robert Stevenson. There it is. By the way. Um, yeah, so uh, y- young Biff Hawk is played by the same actor who had to shoot old Yeller. Yeah. Um, why did we like, why were we, I don't even want to say that we liked Biff so much. Why were we so interested in Biff? I think we were charmed by the fact that this character could have been written as a real one dimensional shithead kid. Yeah. And he really wasn't. He was a real sweet kid. Like, he was kind of dumb. Yeah. He reminded me of Kronk in Emperor's New Groove. Yeah. That was that was who he like evoked the most for me. Yeah. Like he's dumb and yeah, he's he is one of the antagonists. Like he's going along with his dad. Right. And his dad is wreaking havoc on Brainerd's life. <laughs> and Biff comes up with some parts of the plan and he's kind of having fun with it, but not because he's evil. No. And at one point, like, he finds out his dad has bet against Medfield, his own college, and he's scandalized. Oh yeah. He's like, Dad, how could you do that? And then it of course, you know. It turns out bad because yeah. they win the basketball game. Like, Biff never really gets redeemed in this. And I think for, like, two things uh, along with that. One, I don't think he needs to get redeemed. No. Because he's, you you know he's not, like, a really bad person. Yeah. He, I think he's, like, the perfect example of a character who can become, like, one of the heroes in the sequels. Right. You know? Yeah. Because we, we're fine with him. We like Biff. Biff's fine. Yeah. He just is unhelpful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's an actor named Tommy Kirk, who also, as we say, was in Old Taylor. <laughs> And uh, he was Merlin Jones in the Merlin Jones series of movies. Oh, there it is. Just in the Monkey's Uncle. No, this is a. I don't. Just, I'm God. sorry. I mean, we've already talked about Kurt Russell, like computer wore tennis shoes, strongest man in the world. Like you haven't seen. Ugh, it's such a shame. I, I'm so. I don't know what to tell you. But now we have Disney Plus. We're not sponsored at all. Nope. <laughs> I don't even see what's the point of advertising for Disney Plus. Yeah, like I, I everyone, mean, everyone already has it. Everyone knows about Disney Plus. It's like mentioning Netflix. Like, yeah, it's just like saying like Kleenex at this point. That was really like, I would say USA centric, the thing we just said too. That's okay. If you're listening to this and you're in a country that doesn't have Disney Plus We're yet. We're sorry. Very sorry. Um, It's fine. It's we not have, that good. We have no control over Disney Plus. Yeah. And you know what? They're not paying us. Disney Plus kind of sucks. <laughs> Boo. Wow. It's uh, it's just no good. Well, Son of Flubber's not on it, which oh. doesn't make any sense to me. It's terrible. We would have watched it. 
but it wasn't easy to get. Anyway, <laughs> we are off track. I really like Beth. Can we go back to uh, like minor antagonist as well? <laughs> sure. Let's talk about Professor Ashton. What a shithead. Yeah, he's the worst. Now, let me ask you this. Does he deserve to be murdered in his car? <laughs> no, he's just kind of like a classic. He He's the kind of guy that would say he's in the friend zone. He just is hanging around Professor Brainerd's fiance, waiting for her to be sick of him and turn to him instead. Like, he never goes as far as to say to Brainerd, like, because this would be stupid if you were to say to Brainerd, like, I am going to steal your woman. Yes. Like, that would make him, like, a, an overt antagonist. Mm-hmm. And I don't think this actor could pull it off. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm so I'm glad they didn't do that. It's, yes. it's a little more low level, but we as an audience know, like, we know who he's after. Yes. He's after her. He's trying to woo her. And Brainerd knows it, too. And here, <laughs> okay, so Brainerd, as an adult human person, could go to another adult human person, in this case, his fiance, or I guess ex-fiance. Yeah. Well, it's on ex- hiatus. Ex and then current again. Yeah. And he could talk to her and explain everything that's going on and saying, like, hey, I, emotions, let's talk about our emotions. Yeah. They could do that. They could do that. Instead. I don't think they did that in the 60s, though. No. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's totally true. Yeah. Instead, he has, we've already talked about it. He invents a flying car. Yeah. Powered by the flubber. Yes. And what he decides to do <laughs> is he decides to fly his car to her house. And the professor, Shelby Ashton, is leaving her house. And he thinks, I am going to make this guy think he's crazy, think himself crazy, and also maybe murder him <laughs> by taking my car. And basically jumping on his car. I'm going to jump up and down on his car <laughs> while he's driving. Yes. Probably at a speed that makes it not safe. <laughs> As if it were safe to begin with. And then we get what is maybe the longest scene in the whole movie because the guy's crazy now and he flies away and he gets pulled over by a cop. Yeah. And the cop, how long would you say the breathalyzer scene is in this movie? It was long enough for me to research the history of breathalyzers as we watched the scene. (laughs) Did you know that the first commercial breathalyzer for roadside use by the police was from the early 1930s? They've been around that long. I did know that. Want to ask me how? Because I told you before. You told me right in the middle of it. I found out in real time. It was fascinating. Uh, But yeah, that scene goes on for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, he basically tries to murder this guy. Yes. There's a lot of peril in this movie. Yeah. Like... But everything's okay. Yeah. I'm I'm so so sorry. sorry. (laughs) I want to go back to the basketball game. Okay. I'm sorry that I stopped you before. That's I wanted to set up more of the characters. That's fine. And we also should talk about Ned Brainerd after this. Yeah. Let's talk about him as a character. Is he capable of murder? (laughs) And that's the thing we need to figure out here. I don't think he's capable of intent because he's absent-minded, you see. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. He's like not an accessory to his own murder. No. Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to the basketball game. Okay. You were talking about their team, and their yeah. team is too short. Too short. And they also don't have their star player, Biff Hawk, because he's been suspended. He's not that tall either. He's very tiny. I don't really see how this one other kid who's not that tall <laughs> this, would have helped them too much. This one tiny white kid is the star of the basketball team, apparently. It just makes no sense. It makes no sense. So Brainerd's big idea is... He's going to put flubber on their shoes and various parts of their body and the ball makes it sound so they gross. can jump higher and uh-huh. the ball is better. Okay. Now, I want to talk about consent a little bit. Okay. Consent to be put in danger. Okay. Does he ask any of the players if he may do this? No. He just does it. Yes. In, in the guise of giving them a pep talk in the locker room. Mm-hmm. Now, my next question is this. How lucky is he that none of them died horribly? I mean, given that this is, again, a Disney children's movie, he's, like, not that lucky because it was unlikely that they were going to kill off, you know, children in a Disney children's movie from Mm -hmm. 1961. But in the sense of real-world implications... Yes, he is quite lucky that none of them died horribly. Well, I think you make a really good point about the fact that, like, in the world of the movie, of course, no one's going to die. Right. Like, what he was doing was totally fine. No one was going to get hurt. The I, thing that I don't like in the term, in terms of the real world applications of this is that what they're doing is clearly against the rules of basketball. That's You read my mind <laughs> because there, we actually get a scene where the coach for the opposing team, uh, he teaches, a, he coaches a team of seven foot tall behemoths. Yes. Um, who are now losing very bad. <laughs> and he's he's his butt is all hurt about that and he goes to the ref and he says what are you gonna do aren't you gonna stop them and the ref says what would you like me to do tell them they can't jump 
He says there's no rule about jumping too high. Right. To which my response is, sure, but there probably is a rule about using like substances to artificially make yourself jump high or putting uh-huh. things on the ball. You know what I mean? I'm sure there's a rule about that. And here's how I explain that. Yes. In movies like this, not just in this one particular case. Yes. It's the kind of thing where if in the world of the movie, your main character has created a substance that no one's ever invented before, mm-hmm. and it can do a thing that seemingly breaks the laws of physics. Yes. Why would anyone involved assume that there's some kind of artificial enhancement going on? I guess. That's fair enough. Well, the interesting thing is this actually happens a lot in real life, that the technology of the sport advances faster than the rules of the sport. It happened a couple Olympics ago. I was just watching a YouTube video, I think, about this, where all of the swimmers from certain countries, um, particularly the U.S. and other teams, were wearing this particular kind of suit that had just been invented. And something like 98% of the world records that that were broken at that Olympics and I think some enormous percentage of the gold medals they were all wearing this particular suit because it had so little drag they went so much faster and the Olympic committee then banned the suit because it was so expensive that not all the teams could afford it so it was essentially like um you could basically buy a gold medal yeah it was essentially rewarding the richer countries that could afford to put their swimmers in this suit but it wasn't illegal at the time that they were using it like it was perfectly fine like they didn't get their gold medals taken away or anything like that Mm -hmm. um it was perfectly legal to use but since then it has been banned and there's there's other things like that as well that like people invent moves like in in ice skating that they do and then they're banned because they're too dangerous or something like that but they didn't think ahead of time so anyway i just happened to see a youtube video about this it was really interesting yeah and so i guess my question would then be when does the ncaa end up banning flubber shoes yeah i mean like clearly immediately after this well you made a good point too it's like would these two teams even be playing each other (laughs) that's exactly i think i said that in the um the 1997 version because they were even further apart right like their skill but like (laughs) they're i don't know much about college athletics but i know there's like division one division two division three like that's there for a reason (laughs) it's so that like it's so, you know, the University of Michigan doesn't end up playing like, I don't know, East, any other team, East Bumblefuck University with these tiny, skinny children. Uh, also, super quick, before we leave the basketball scene. Yeah. There is a song that is sung. This is the Medfield fight song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who do you think wrote this song? Oh, the Sherman Brothers. It's the fucking Sherman Brothers. <laughs> It's always the fucking Sherman Brothers. Listen to our episode on Charlotte's Web and Mary Poppins. Yes. If you want to hear us talk more about them. Correct. So at this point, we have met all our characters. We've gotten some bits of business. He's done some cheating. You know, some real hardcore sports cheating. I was going to say some light cheating, but okay. No, this is real bad sports cheating. It's bad sports cheating. Um, Alonzo P. Hawk has lost a lot of money on this game. Mm-hmm. Um, because as we know, like he bet on the other he guys. He bet on the wrong team. He shouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some real fun stuff that goes on because Professor Shelby Ashton, the low-level antagonist teaches at rutland the other college yes and also wants to marry brainerd's girlfriend whose name i don't remember so there's lots of (laughs) betty (laughs) betsy carlisle betsy (laughs) there's a lot of fun stuff that happens at this game um before we move on i do want to talk a little bit about fred mcmurray in this movie um because as like he has tried to murder someone (laughs) he's done a lot of cheating uh he's endangered the life of his dog he has left this woman on (laughs) the altar multiple times why do we still like this character? Because I like him. <laughs> I don't know. Is it Fred McMurray? Yeah, I, I wrote down your quote about Fred M- McMurray. You said, how does he look young and old at the same time? <laughs> if you told me he was 50, I wouldn't be surprised. If you told me he was 37, I would say, I mean, he doesn't look he good for rough. 37, yeah. but I believe it. Probably a smoker. Uh, Fred McMurray. Like, it's it's weird for me that he's he's kind of like Robert Stevenson, where Robert Stevenson, we first found out about him on our show by talking about Jane Eyre. Mm-hmm. And... But then he has this, like, huge second career with Disney. And Fred McMurray's the same type of thing. Like, in 1944, he was the star of Double Indemnity. Okay. And then 15 years later, he's the (laughs) absent-minded professor. Well, you know. And then is in Son of Flubber. Gotcha. And he's a fucking delight. Like... This he's just incredible. Yeah. He's so good in this movie. He's got such a great energy. Apparently, this is all from that potentially apocryphal story about him meeting Doctor Boom. But apparently, <laughs> he, he like Boom. he like worked in aspects of the guy into his performance. Uh huh. I just think he's a delight. I don't have much to say, but this goes back to the thing I was saying before about consistency. Mm-hmm. Like. 
everyone in this movie, Fred McMurray especially, is bringing 100% yes. the entire time. Yes. And that's the thing I feel like we keep saying about Disney in this era, like Mary Poppins. Like, everyone's performing at the highest level of what they, they all know what they're there for. Yes. And yeah. it's just impressive because it's just, it's a little, like, sci-fi movie for kids. Yeah. But it's really memorable, and he's really fun in it. Yeah, I agree. Um, do you want to talk about the third point of the plot? Well, so there's a whole new plot that is getting entered where Brainerd wants to do his, his you know, civic duty, and he wants to do a couple of different things. One, he wants to save Medfield, and he thinks Flubber can do that by selling it. Yes. And licensing it, and they can make money. Yeah. And then the other question is, like, who is he going to sell it to? Well, it's 1961, so the armed forces. Yes. You know, this is this that, this is a different time. Yeah. And there's some really funny scenes that I don't even really want to ruin, where he, like, is... Uh, interrupting meetings with heads of the air force and the navy he's and like the getting army bounced around from department to department because everyone thinks he's like a crank yeah but actually he's invented this thing this was actually the scene where i really like it hit home the idea that like everyone was performing at 100 percent because there are actors who are on the screen for like a minute yeah and they're just as good as someone who's in it for the entire movie yeah and then by the end uh he is now flying to washington dc in his flying car they have God, I completely forgot about some of this stuff. There are parts of this movie that are super slow. Yeah. But there is a whole thing where the car with the flubber is switched for a regular car by Alonzo P. Hawk and his son. Yeah. And they have to, and, and Ned and Betsy have to go break the car out. And so they end up like having kind of a showdown with Hawk. Yes. And they win. Yes. Because of course they do. And then they fly to DC. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't he like bump down on their car too? Like yeah. he's going to murder them too? Yep. And then yep. the same cop pulls the guy over? Yep. Yeah, it's a whole it's, thing. It's a whole thing. We and, don't want to explain the joke. And they fly to DC and you're thinking like there's still 20 minutes left of yeah. this movie. How could there be 20 minutes left? It seems like this is the end. But we have to get a huge long scene of them just flying around the skies of Washington DC almost getting shot down by the Air Force like multiple times. Yeah, and also the writers of the film suddenly deciding that Betsy's stupid, which oh, really yeah. upset me because she had been so great throughout the rest of the film. And I was like, this is a great female character in this old movie. And suddenly it turned into the female characters underwritten because she was suddenly an idiot. And she was asking him all these dumb questions that he had like had to roll his eyes and answer and suddenly she's like he's like okay well we're gonna land and she's like oh no my hair i can't po couldn't possibly and like she's just a completely different character in this scene it was like oh we didn't make this character look dumb enough quick like let's make the lady look real dumb before the end of the movie wasn't there was, the thing where she like thought the lincoln memorial was grant's tomb or yeah, something like that yeah she thought yeah she thought the jefferson memorial was grant's tomb and he's like no dear that's in new york and she was like tee -hee! and it was really stupid yeah it's <laughs> It's it's not great. Yeah. And it's weird, too, because you liked the female character up until this point. Yeah. And they, then what would you say happened? She became underwritten. That's it's a bummer. It's, it's a bummer. What can I say? Yeah. But then the movie ends. <laughs> yes. And everything's end. fine. Yeah. And they get married. Clearly. And then the car flies off. Yes. And it's all very sweet. And like, yeah. Are there flaws? Sure. Absolutely. But like fun movie. Yeah. Super fun. Super fun. I love this movie. When it was I was great. Kid. Still super, super fun to watch. Yeah. I mean, the amazing thing, and we haven't really talked about Flubber as a character, which it is much more a character in the 97 movie. Well, than... As we said, the, the Flubber's not sentient, so we don't need to. Right. But like in this movie, the interesting thing is the Flubber looks like nothing because it's like, it's black and white movie. You can't really see it. You, you don't even really see what it looks like. It's, it's basically nothing. And it's all kind of on the strength of their performance that the flubber is is anything or anything interesting. I mean, there's the scene where Keenan Wynn is bouncing up and down in front of in front of the house and he can't get he can't get back down. And then his dad, Edwin, shows up as the head of the fire department. And all of that is performance. None of that is like CGI flubber. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There, well, no, there is some fun stuff in it. There's a lot of scenes in the movie where anytime you see the flubber like bouncing, like it is animated. Yeah. It's like cell animation on yeah. top of it. Like I actually was really impressed by the special effects in this movie. Yeah. No, like, they're really cool. It's like low key, super, super good special effects for the time. Totally. Um, But yeah, flubber doesn't need to be a character. It's not a character. It's mm -hmm. rubber. It looks like Play-Doh. It's totally fine. And then they remade this movie in 1997. Well, before we go there, I want to talk about how they remade this movie in 1988. Okay. This bums me out because we can't, I couldn't find this anywhere. Okay. And I wanted to watch it so badly. But for the magical world of Disney, mm -hmm. the show, one of the episodes was a remake of The Absent-Minded Professor. Gotcha. So there is this episode that stars a cool, like, 
interesting people. Like cool 80s people? Yeah, Harry Anderson as Professor Henry Crawford. This is also starting a weird thing where like all the names change in all of the remakes. I don't understand why. We talked about this again and again. It's very unusual, and I don't know why. Well, it's not unusual. It's very odd, and I don't know why it's such a common thing to just change all the names. Yeah, but Harry Anderson of Night Court and yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, Dave's World. Yeah, yeah. Right? He he recently died. Yeah, it's very sad. It's very sad. I like Harry Anderson. Mary Page Keller, she of a million different TV shows, was mm-hmm. Ellen Whitley, mm. which the the fiance yeah i assume i can't see it and none of the characters are the same but like here's three other people that just happen to be in this steven dorf is in this okay um david pamer is in this don't know who that is you know david pa- david pamer is a delight okay i don't know how to describe him other than he's david pamer okay he's in anyway he's in stuff ed bigley jr gotcha you know him yeah but anyway, there's cool people, and it looked like it was fun and maybe bad, and I really wanted to see it, but we couldn't see it, and it's a bummer, and it bums me out. Um, but as you say, in 1997, some people remade this as a movie called Flubber. I cannot tell you how excited we were when we found out who made this movie. We were terribly excited. Terribly excited, because honestly, this is a movie that I have spent almost no time in my life actually thinking about i never saw it uh-huh. i remember that it was a thing uh-huh. i saw the commercials i was super interested back in the 90s like i was i was really interested in like cg mm-hmm. i remember being like anytime a movie came out that you did special effects like with cg i was like i need to i am i am passionately interested in this movie yes and i remember seeing the commercials and thinking that the flubber looked cool but i never actually saw it you you said you did see it. You think? I you know, I don't know. I probably saw it, or maybe you just saw like a commercial for it at the beginning of a VHS tape. Who knows? Who right. can say? <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Yes. Do you think you can characterize for anyone who didn't hear our episode on Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street? What were some of the reactions that we had to the what nineteen ninety four? version 94 or 95 whatever the one with richard attenborough that was written and produced by john hughes Mm -hmm. and directed by les mayfield we thought it was not good but was it like not good in a forgettable way no it was a it was kind of batshit right not good like kind of fun it was fun it was not good right so how excited were we when we found out that Flubber 1997 was produced and written by John Hughes and I mean, directed by Les Mayfield? Yeah. <laughs> Disappointed? No, no, the opposite. The opposite? The opposite. I mean, I felt like when we found that out, any hope that it was going to be like really, really good kind of went out the window. Yeah. Which is unfair. Like, I want to be clear, that's an unfair thing for us to think. But as it happened, correct. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So the, they're the people who made this movie. Mm-hmm. It's... Like, so similar in so many ways to Miracle on 34th Street. Like, um, the original screenwriter, Bill Walsh, was given screenwriting credit on this movie, just as the original writer of Miracle was given screenwriting credit on that movie by John Hughes. Mm -hmm. There are some changes that happen. No structural changes, like, whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But some of the characters are changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, like, one of the things we found with that one is there wasn't really a bad guy in Miracle on 34th Street. But then in the remake, there's 100% a hundred percent like bad guy, a bad guy, like a, a villain. villain with henchmen. Yes, you know. Um, and this one had a similar kind of thing, but then this one also added some shit that is totally like bonkers. Yeah, that I can't wait to talk about. Banana pants. And I mean, the other thing, even though this movie was trying to add stuff and be out there, I mean, the thing that I found most notable was how utterly predictable it was i mean we're gonna get into it but there were many many times like more so than i can remember in almost any other movie that we've watched that one or the other of us would say the next line before the character said it and it would be the exact line that came out of the character's mouth or one of us would say oh is this what's gonna happen and then that was the thing that happened low end it does low end it does it was just so by the numbers predictable Mm -hmm. even though i think they thought they were being super zany so do you want to get into it yeah let's get into it (laughs) where do you want to where do you want to start well i just want to start with the moment that you took against this movie which was in the first five minutes was it yes okay um (laughs) because it begins in a very similar fashion with um 
the absent-minded professor absent-mindedly working in his in his house mm-hmm. and exploding things by accident this absent- dr boom dr boom dr boom should we just call him that yeah. uh is played by robin williams which we have not mentioned yeah, an actor that's good. who we both admire yes robin williams has done some terrible movies in his time yes Yes. yes, but I, I, I don't know if I want to say them. Maybe it's not the right moment to say them now, but I think I have some wonderful things to say about Robin Williams in this movie. Yes, we can say things about Robin Williams in this movie in a minute. But I just wanted to mention, the moment you took against this movie was when we discovered that instead of a housekeeper, as in the original... And a dog. And a dog... Robin Williams in this movie sort of has a combination of the two, which is a robot butler named Weebo. 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 And you got incredibly indignant once we realized that's what was happening because you were angry that this man had invented a robot butler with sentience and emotion and yet was still just like teaching at the college yeah like the whole point of the movie is that Flubber is the biggest discovery this guy has ever made yes he invented a thinking feeling robot assistant yes that levitates how does it levitate by the way we, we, unclear. The whole, like it's it looks like a little I, what is it even it looks like a flying Roomba basically yeah it's a flying Roomba and with, yeah with antenna with like a little screen that pops up that plays clips from Disney movies for some reason that's what they had the rights to yes. for this but he creates a rubber that can make things fly he already made a flying robot it doesn't make any fucking sense to me yeah to me it completely ruins the illusion of the movie yeah i'm not because at this point flubber should be the most interesting thing that happens in the movie Mm -hmm. what what clue do you think i would have going into this movie that flubber would be the most interesting thing that happens it's the title of the movie it's the fucking title of the goddamn movie and then i find out he created a robot that thinks and feels and lies so that rant you just heard like just to bring you behind the curtain that's that was the first five minutes of watching this movie that was the experience of watching this movie with jeremy latour was like he took against i was so mad also how weird is it that like we have a movie where we have a thinking feeling robot and will wheaton's in it and they're not best friends best friends that doesn't make any sense to me although what did we figure out like data is wesley's best friend but Wesley is not Data's best friend. Jordy is Data's best friend. Clearly. Yes. But we don't tell Wesley that. We don't tell Wesley that because he has no other friends. (laughs) This is, and this is crazy. And I want to, I really do want to dig into Weebo a little bit later. Yeah. But just Weebo's presence is crazy. Yeah. I, but let's talk about how about we talk about the cast a little bit okay let's start with some of the minor characters and work our way back to mr williams okay i feel like in order to do that i want to name just a couple of people who have minor roles in this that we don't need to talk about very much okay nancy olsen betsy carlisle from the first movie is in this movie do you remember her you know it's funny because did you know beforehand and then I knew forgot beforehand and then forgot so now i actually don't know who was she in this movie oh she was like uh she was like the evil guy's secretary she no. was somebody's secretary she, yes yes absolutely she is someone's secretary i'm trying to think like when, when there was an older lady in this movie it was when they go to ford with their flying car right because they're going to sell the flying car to ford right she's the secretary for the guy that runs ford yes i remember now because she can't be the executive no no God forbid no we can't that can't happen although they made the they gave robin williams his girl friend a promotion from secretary to college president right but having done that obviously they can't elevate any more women which is kind of nice like if you're going to take if you have the secretary from the first one and the college president is a character just combine them yeah that's why not? fine it's fine that's fine but anyway nancy olsen's in it that's fun seeing her or not fun if you didn't know that it was her uh let's talk about will wheaton for a second mm-hmm. he is okay there the antagonists have changed yes have changed greatly okay um so let me paint a picture in the original, we have a primary antagonist, his hench person, and we have, like, and they've, he's got some guys that work for him. And then we also have, like, the romantic antagonist. Yes. Right? In this one, let's talk about the romantic antagonist. Okay. So he is no longer an English professor from Rutland College. Mm-hmm. He still works for Rutland College, but he teaches chemistry. Yes. And it turns out he and Dr. Br- he and Professor Brainerd used to work together. Uh-huh. And he stole his ideas. Yes. And now they are rivals. Yes. And he is played by one of the greatest actors to grace stage and screen, Shooter McGavin himself, Christopher McDonald. This is all true. I was so fucking excited when I found out he was in this movie. And then I was even more excited when I found out that he was playing just an out-and-out bad guy. Yeah. 
Yeah. So <laughs> remember in the first one when you were like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he wants his girlfriend. He's not going to like come right out and say it. In this one, he turns to Robin Williams and he says, I am going to steal your woman, just so you know. Mm -hmm. I love her, and I'm going to take her from you. Stole all your ideas. I'm going to steal her, too. Yep. That's um, what he says. I'm stating my intentions. Now, my question is why he was invited to the wedding, because he said both weddings. <laughs> well, yeah, we, there's no background about how they know. How, no. Like, yeah, it doesn't, it uh, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, he's in it. He's delightful because he's always delightful. Yeah. A thing happens to him that I kind of want to wait for for a minute. Yeah. We need to talk about the flubber in detail. And so we can hold off on that. Yeah. We also have now, this is that thing we keep talking about where the names of the characters all change. Uh -huh. So like he's not, what's the name of the guy in the original? It's uh, Professor Shelby Ashton. In this one, he is Wilson Croft. For whatever reason. Why? But, I don't know. Like Brainerd himself, like they changed his first name. Now he's Philip Brainerd. I did a thing where I wrote down all the character names and I thought I'll, I'll put in bold all the, diff all the new names. Turned out what I needed to do was only put in bold the one name that's the same, and it's Brainerd. Gotcha. That's the only thing that makes it from the original well, into this one. Brain. It has the word brain in it, and right. he's smart. I think they should have called him Professor Boom. <laughs> Dr. Boom. Dr. Boom. Dr. Boom. Um, so we had Alonzo P. Hawk. In this one, we have Chester Henniker, mm -hmm. who's played by Raymond J. Barry. Wrong um, kid, dad. Yeah. <laughs> He's, Wrong kid dad. He's the dad from Walk Hard. Yes. The Dewey Cox story. Yes. Um, he's also the dad in Justified. Mm. He's really he's real good. Very different character than yeah. I've seen him play before. That's funny because um the mom from Walk Hard is also in Justified. Uh yes, she is. Yes. Mag <laughs> I was gonna say Mags Bennett. Mags Bennett is her name on Justified. Margot Martindale. Yes, who you love. Yeah, Margot of the Margot Martindales. There it is. Yeah. Um she <laughs> this is a stupid joke. Uh Will Wheaton is in this. He yes. plays the son. In as 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 we had in the original, we have a son. Poor Will Wheaton. God. Like, okay, why did he get cast in this movie, do you think? Because he played Wesley Crusher on Star Trek The Next Generation. That's not why. Why did he get cast in this movie as this character? Because he was born to play this role. <laughs> More than that, he just looks exactly just, like the original actor. Yeah, he looks like the kid that shot Old Yeller. <laughs> yeah, that's it. He just looks exactly <laughs> like him, and, and there we go. Now, everything... This was the biggest bummer. No, no, Weebo's the biggest bummer. But <laughs> Wesley being in this was a bummer, too. Because, like I said, we liked Biff. Yeah. He was a fun character. Yeah, he's, like, caught up with the bad guy, but he's not a bad guy no he's a good kid yeah how would you describe bennett henniker bennett henniker is a whiny asshole and also 30 <laughs> yeah he's 25 I, he looks older he's not a college student anymore he's not a college student he's a whiny shithead but he's absolutely a villain in this movie. Yeah. Like, he got promoted. I mean, in as much as he's in it, because he's not in a lot of it. But every every moment that he's on screen, he's like, he has no mustache because... He, he can't. You couldn't at the time. No. And <laughs> and he's just twirling it as much as he possibly can. <laughs> That's right. It, it's ridiculous. Um, we do have a couple of henchmen. Mm -hmm. I loved them from the minute they stepped on screen all up until the moment after the movie where I found out what their character names were and then I hated them. Okay, go ahead. Their character names are Smith and Wesson. It's dumb. Which is stupid. It's stupid. But they are played by Clancy Brown and Ted Levine. And they're great. What was the what was our big like takeaway about these two characters from this movie that was written by John Hughes? Well, there is literally shot for shot a scene from Home Alone yeah. where something like falls on one of their heads. There's a lot of pratfalls. There's, There's a lot of pratfalls. They have a lot of damage that's done to them. Yes. There <laughs> There's also a little a little nod to the parents in the audience, little one of those little inside jokes that the kids won't get where they have a little lotion scene with Buffalo Bill yep. in a Disney movie. They're, yeah, because like Brainerd takes the flubber and turns it into a lotion that yeah. he spreads on like a golf ball and, and a bowling ball. Its, he rubs it on its skin. Oh, man, it, it puts the lotion on its skin. Oh, God. Oh, I hate that. It I hate puts that. the lotion on its skin. I genuinely hate that i'm not attracted to you anymore how many times did i make that joke during the movie so too many, many times too many times you obviously made the joke even before they had the lotion scene so I'm then so we excited. looked at each other and we were so excited it's great Ugh. they're great no they, they're two actors who are just wonderful character actors they were great in this they my big uh criticism of uh, miracle on 34th street is that the two henchmen like nothing bad ever happens to them right and i felt like what they were going for was more of a looney tunes type thing mm -hmm. and what do we call them, boris and natasha yeah yeah in in this one, I get what I wanted. Yeah. They are villains in a Bugs Bunny cartoon yes. and much damage is done unto them and it is funny every time and they're delightful and I have no beef with them whatsoever. It's just, I think calling them Smith and Wesson is just like too on the nose. Yeah. I didn't like that. It's dumb. 
I put the lotion on. Skip. Please never do that ever again. I can't promise that. So now let's get to the female part. So as I said before, she got a promotion because in the original she's a secretary, mm-hmm. but now she's the college president. Yep. And we never really see her do anything presidential other than like we know she works in an office with papers well she sits behind the desk she sits behind the desk and we also know that she goes to work on the day of her wedding which is at eight o'clock at night or uh-huh. six thirty or whatever um so she's played by marcia k harden who we just saw in the bad news bears what is this game that we're playing right now where we did sabrina with greg kinnear and yeah. then bad news bears with greg kinnear and marcia Gay harden and now we're doing this with marcia Gay harden like what is this game that we're playing i think this is just 90s movie actors apparently like i think that's all that this is i think next episode let's not do any let's not do like these kind of 90s comedies okay well i think we can guarantee that yeah um what'd you think of her in this like what did you think of the character i so i did not like her okay i thought she was dare i say it underwritten oh no um <laughs> I there's genuinely no explanation for why the other professor is her friend. He's just kind of always there. And it made her look kind of stupid that like this guy clearly is trying to, quote, steal her from Robin Williams. But the other thing is like, I didn't understand their relationship at all i didn't her see and brainer her and brainer yeah i didn't see they have they did not have any chemistry to my eyes there was really they really barely even talk to each other other than like once the hijinks are sort of ensuing and they're talking about like the things that need to happen in order for them to go get flubber from the villains or whatever but there's this scene right at the beginning of the movie where they're trying to establish that he is absent-minded. Yep. And as an absent-minded person myself, I took offense to this scene because it didn't make him seem like absent-minded in a fun, quirky way. It made it seem like he had a genuine neurological problem and she was upset with him for that. Yeah. Um, Which is kind of upsetting actually too now that we know Robin Williams' whole story. Right. I mean, I'm just sitting here sad. Yeah. It's, so good it's job. very sad because they're like sitting at a table, you know, on the quad. Um. <laughs> <laughs> did you say that for four years when you were in college? No, we did not have a quad. You didn't have a what? A quad. A quad. <laughs> Do you want to play some Fribby on the quad? <laughs> the quad. Uh, no, they did play Ultimate, um, but it was on Westland's Lawn. <laughs> I went to college in the early 2000s. Of course, they played Ultimate. I know. Um, on the quad. It was not on the quad. It was on Westland's lawn. Um, anyway. And they're having a conversation about the wedding. And they're trying to remind him that it's it's like her and her secretary, right? And they're trying yeah. to remind him that it's tonight. And he's like, yeah, what? Yeah, hmm, yeah, of course. What are we talking about? Like it, it, it makes him it makes him seem like he has like amnesia. <laughs> It yeah. does not make him seem like fun and absent minded. Like, I've, have you ever like have you known anyone who has experienced like a traumatic brain injury? Uh, no, but I've had a conversation with someone with dementia. I mean, same kind of thing where like talking to someone who's going through that is. I I want to try not to sugarcoat it. It's heartbreaking and makes you realize that our bodies are sometimes a prison. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. I feel sad for Robin Williams. I know. Um, but it goes too far. Yes, it like, goes too far. Yes, it's like a scene from Awakenings. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Except he's not the doctor. Except he's not the doctor. Now he's the patient. Why did I write down you switched the samples? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's the whole conversation. <laughs> it's the rivalry. The whole rivalry he right. has with uh, with the other professor. So that you could have Provasic. It's from The Fugitive. Yeah. So anyway, I did not like that. I did not like that establishing of that character in that way because it made her seem like a harpy that was angry at someone who had a problem like a real problem that Mm -hmm. he could not help it doesn't it doesn't work it doesn't work for me didn't work for me but do you want to talk about let's get into Brainerd a little bit more let's talk about Robin Williams as Philip Brainerd yes apparently I don't know what's wrong with Ned is Ned just like an old-fashioned name yeah I think it's an old name anyway so Phil Phil (laughs) experienced a traumatic brain injury at some point clearly Uh, probably in one of the many explosions that he did in his house I mean He's he's a great Dr. Boom. Yeah. I have this to say that I found uh, pleasantly surprising. Yes. Uh, Rob Williams is amazing. Yes. Um, he is a goddamn... He was a goddamn treasure. Yes. And he can, I, I think he can do anything. Yes. Because as you said before, he has been in some stinkers. Yeah. This was 
uh, a flawed movie. Yeah. Um, pretty pretty flawed. I, I wouldn't say that it was tons of fun. He's never anything less than stellar in any moment he's in in this movie, though. He's giving 100%. Always. But like, he is not phoning it in. Yeah. We we recently were talking about, um, oh, Walter Matthau, when we were talking about the Bad News Bears, and I was like, oh, yeah, he cries in this movie. I don't think I've ever seen Walter Matthau cry before. I don't think I've ever seen a Robin Williams movie where he doesn't cry. Like, he's <laughs> really, he's his emotions are, are on the surface. He manages to find the emotional core of every single character he ever plays, and he makes me feel feelings, not in a manipulative way, in, like, an honest way. Yes. And this is where I would tie it to, back to Weebo. Yeah. So. Uh, let's talk about Weebo. Okay. Here's the quick version, and we'll get into more detail. Weebo has feelings, and this is stupid. And Weebo is like jealous of his relationship with um with his fiance, Doctor Doctor Sarah. Yeah, and like lies to him, and is seems to be intentionally trying to like sabotage him going to the wedding. Yeah. So all of this stuff happens. Let's. Ju- I'm gonna spoil this. I-, I wrote down as a joke: Is the robot in love with him? And yes, we find out we indeed. Find out that was true. Yep. Um, again, he created a robot that's capable of love, but he also made green goo, and that's clearly the biggest that's the biggest discovery he's ever gonna make. Yep. He has to have genuinely emotional scenes with a flying robot. Oh, it flies too, yeah. as I said. Yes. He has to have genuinely emotional scenes with a flying robot that has feelings. And <laughs> despite my anger at the robot. I cared about the robot because he cared about the robot. He cared so deeply about the robot. Well, not only like, did he fi- have- find you someone who looks at you the way Robin Williams <laughs> looks at a flying <laughs> robot. Weebo. Not only did he have genuinely emotional scenes with the flying robot, he also had to mourn its death. Oh, it dies. It dies. Murdered. <laughs> And he's in tears. And Jeremy was in tears. And we're all in tears. But even though, a ca- because a character that was a robot that we disliked died. It is. Oh. It's like, it's it's just this amazing example of how dumb the choice was to create <laughs> Weibo, but also how amazing and how much of an asset Robin Williams was. Yes. He was incredible. Yes. I, it shocks me how much energy he brought to this movie. Yes. Like it shouldn't anymore because he's Robin Williams. How weird is it that this was like a year after The Birdcage? Oh, jeez. Yeah, like, that's crazy. Just absolutely crazy. The mid-90s Robin Williams, I mean, he was at his peak, right? Yeah. Like, um, I, I, you know, I just, uh, with a lot of things, I struggle to find like behind the scenes footage and stuff like that and like making of. There are just like two clips I found on YouTube that was just B-roll of like while they were shooting this movie. It seemed like it was like more fun to make than anything. Yeah, I bet. He looked like he, he it just looked like he was having so much fun on the set every minute. I can't. He's wonderful. Are you OK? Yeah. I miss him, too. Okay. OK. When Jeremy and I were first dating, that was right about the time Robin Williams died and we like sort of clung to each other. And I think it was kind of an emotional turning point in our relationship. Well, was, I had to rely on you emotionally. Yeah, we went to a Mexican restaurant and had margaritas and ate chips and cried. <laughs> it was it was nice. It just hit me. It hit me more than I thought I would have gotten hit by it. Yeah, it's uh, look, can we move on? Yeah, I'm sorry. Jesus. <laughs> like, yeah, we all miss him. It's terrible, it's terrible, and we miss him. God, Weibo. Yes. Fuck this robot. Yeah. Fuck this stupid. What are some of What are some of the things that this robot does in this movie that are just not just like indic- indicative of like the robot being kind of a sociopath, but also just stupid? Well, it builds itself a profile of a perfect woman for him, for him, and then projects that image. Like, you know, like Princess Leia being projected saying, help us, Obi-Wan Kenobi, our only hope. Yeah. And. um, Like goes up to his bedroom. Like to wake him. Like, and I unclear what the thinking is that he's going to do in this kid's movie with the beautiful projection woman waking him up. I don't know. It's very weird. But it's an idea that doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. Like, here's how it comes back. They She does it once. He wakes up and, and the and she's like, oh, oh, God. And the hologram like goes away. Yeah. And they have like an emotional conversation that yes. affected me more than I wanted it to because Robin Williams is a treasure. Yeah. And then later in the movie, after she's dead, she gets, um, I can't remember if it's Smith or Wesson. I think Buffalo Bill. I think he's the one that like takes a bat. Yeah, and, like, she gets bludgeoned to death. Yeah, and then dies. Um, she doesn't even get like a death speech. No. Like he he and and the fiance like they find her in the basement in his lab, and she and the robots all smashed, and he's like talking to her, and that like, scene goes up. on for like twenty like, minutes. Wake up, Weibo! Wake up! And Weibo doesn't even get like a I I love 
you bleh. no like nothing no, like it's that it's just a broken road it's, we got a charger we got a charger back up and then no it's dead yeah and uh, except she didn't and then okay <laughs> he goes to his computer and he finds that oh yeah she has like a word that pops up on the screen and he the word is the name of a file that's on his computer and he finds the file and it's the lady she made yeah and the lady has a prepared speech to him um like if you're re- if you're reading this i'm already dead yeah <laughs> Like, all I'm saying is we ask our phones to do shit in 2020 yeah. that doesn't go well. Yeah. He made it. Anyway. It does not matter. Uh, it literally does not matter. Flying rubber is more exciting. So in the speech, it says, like, I have plans. I have left plans on this computer for a new Weibo. Yeah. And it is Weebet. And it is it is her daughter. And so that we have another flying robot at the end of the movie. The end. And it's that's dumb. Okay. So one thing we have not even talked about, even a little, is the fucking title character of this movie we have not mentioned the flubber even once at all what do you mean character like in the original it's Mm play-doh there's no character it just bounces a lot how could it explain flubber in this movie is sentient he has created a sentient being okay that yes he has done this how has this guy done this twice (laughs) how has he done this twice (laughs) how has he done this twice and this is not the thing like okay he creates a sentient robot, yeah. but we're supposed to be impressed that he makes flying rubber. Yes. All right. I, I, okay. All right. I'm going to put that one off to the side for a second. Yeah. Okay. He creates flying rubber. It is sentient. Yes. It has thoughts and feelings. It sings a song called the Flubber Mambo. And then the thing that we're supposed to think is more exciting than that is that he takes part of the Flubber, maybe against its will, <laughs> which it has... <laughs> And turns it into <laughs> lotion and spray to make kids play basketball better. Yes. And I'm, I just was so distracted. That, like this movie, I don't think John Hughes was intending to ask like philosophical questions, but they're there. This is like an episode of Star Trek. I just, it bothers me so much because I don't want to watch a movie about a guy who invents flubber and and like go to bed w- with my eyes wide open thinking about the nature of free will and like is is flubber technically enslaved or not like is flubber free to not do the things that he wants yeah. or like but because he created it does he have ownership over this creature that has sentience and free will yeah and i mean to be clear it looks it it is basically singing dancing neon green snot you you said it looks like something from a mucinex commercial and i'm sure i'm not the first person to make that joke it, and the special effects are really good no, they're like really I, good. I think the flubber looks great yeah um did you like the hacky sack reference to like like 90s Remember oh yeah when the flubber is like a hacky sack yep. and he has to hacky sack totally it? i loved my hacky sacks i love my hacky sack Remember you, had, you bought them they were like in the little basket up at the register yeah from of- this right from the store that smelled like patchouli and like uh, <laughs> they were sitting on top of the clear counter that had like the bead necklaces uh-huh I'm pretty sure no one ever worked in those stores. It was just like a sentient pile yeah. of hacky sacks and patchouli. <laughs> the hemp necklaces with the be- with the like rainbow beads. I just remember that you had to like really, you had to break in the hacky sacks Yeah, no, you had to like, because they had like little rice grains in them. So mm-hmm. you had to like kind of crunch it up a lot. So if your hacky sack was like floppy, it meant that you actually like knew how to hacky sack. There's like two groups, of, literally two <laughs> groups of people. Our entire audience right now is in two circles yeah there's no overlap in these (laughs) on one side you have people who absolutely know everything about hacky sacks and are going why are you telling me all this of course i know this and you have another group of people (laughs) that don't give a fuck about hacky sacks no the other group of people is like what is a hacky sack (laughs) what are you talking about i was born in 2005 nope they don't care they don't care what hacky sacks are i i believe that firmly i also just realized that somebody born in 2005 is like fully an adult and that i can't deal with it so we're gonna move on we can't vote yet i also can't count so (laughs) so the Uh... flubber has free will is animated well. I just, there's not much else to say about the Flubber. Like, the Flubber's kind of fun. Yeah. He turns it into a lotion against its will. He turns it into a spray against its will. Mm-hmm. Um, well, the Flubber, I mean, do you want to circle back to the henchman? What the Flubber does to, to no, it's not the henchman. It's, no, um, to, it's, Shooter the profi- it's to Shooter McGavin. So the Flubber <laughs> is flying around. This is the, the denouement of the movie. We've, we've gotten, like, the big bits of action. Like, there was the basketball game, and there was a whole, because it's Robin Williams and because it's the 90s, now we need to have a th- the whole thing before the basketball game where he goes to the basketball court to, like, experiment with the Flubber. Mm-hmm. And he's flying all over the place, and none of it should work. Yeah. Uh, none of it should work at all. Why does it work? Because Robin Williams is great. Yep, that's it. That's the only reason it works. 
And then we get the basketball game. Oh, can I just mention something about the basketball game? Yes. Um, so we have a similar kind of trope, which is that the um, basketball team is very bad because Will Wheaton, their star player, is not allowed to play for them right now yeah. because of his suspension, which is definitely believable um, that Will Wheaton is the star basketball player of any team. Um, definitely, totally believable. But like, <laughs> then... <laughs> I found it really okay. I found it upsetting that the only person of color in this movie was like the one very tall black basketball player on the other team. Yeah. And he didn't have any lines. Nope. He, he just like looked confused sometimes. Well, he's confused because the other team. Because of the were, flubber. Yeah, they're bouncing around like crazy. Because of the flubber. And, and also, we have the same conversation about how like they're not breaking any rules because there's no rule against jumping too high, which. Like, again, like, clearly there's some rule about using substances to enhance your performance in some way. Anyway, that's the basketball game. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. Then we get, they change things up a little bit. There's a scene that's added that's never really in the original where there's a confrontation. Mm -hmm. So, honestly, I can't even remember how the whole thing is set up. Oh, I remember. So, Smith and Wesson, yeah, Smith and Wesson go to the lab in the basement. Right. They kill Weebo. Yeah. And they steal the flubber. Yes. And Robin Williams and Marsha Gay Harden have to get the flubber back, so they go to the bad guy's house. The bad guy, who is now in league with <laughs> Wilson Croft. With Shooter McGavin. With Shooter McGavin. And that was something that never happened in the original. No. Those two characters I don't even think I ever met. Nope. So we get there and all <laughs> our villains are there. Daddy villain, son villain, hench villains, uh, d doctor villain. Yes. They're all there. They have the flubber. Uh, Robin Williams and Marsha Gay Harden have put uh, some flubber on their shoes. Yeah. And they decide we are going to bounce our way to victory. Yes. So we have the whole big scene where they bounce around a whole bunch and they beat the bad guys and kick their butts with the flubber. Mm -hmm. um, and then all we have left is the flubber is flying around and Shooter McGavin is standing there and he is yelling and the flubber flies into his mouth and it comes out of a different hole. We see him clearly deeply uncomfortable yep and then he poops himself to death he doesn't well yes he is he's clearly gonna die now i have one <laughs> thing to say about christopher mcdonald right here if i had to make a list of things that had to be like the most intimidating acts that anyone could undertake in their yeah. life you have to do physical comedy purely physical comedy opposite robin williams yes that sounds really fucking intimidating. Very intimidating. Does he does a good job. He does a really good job. Yes. I applaud him, A, for doing it, and B, for doing a good job. For a good job at, at in a scene which, let us not forget, is literally a man pooping flubber out his butt and clearly dying because it r races out of him at 100 miles an hour and no one could survive that. There's no way he's not dead. <laughs> so Shooter McGavin dies after pooping himself to death. <laughs> and they just like, back slowly out of the room <laughs> let us never speak of this <laughs> that's the end of the movie then they no there's other they get married oh the do this the, the flying car yeah they there's get married car. and they fly away in the flying car and they have the new weebo yeah um they have uh oh god i completely forgot about this this is not oh by the way um sir not appearing in this film uh, I have a joint nomination for Sir not appearing in this film. Okay, Charlie the dog and Mrs. Chatsworth. Yes, are Sir not are are the Sir and Lady are the dog and Lady not appearing in this film. Right, because they're combined in the character of Weibo. So there is a scene that happens with Weibo, and to me, it is. It's everything. It's everything about this movie. It is Robin Williams being completely believable and emotional. It's Weebo being stupid and annoying and problematic. And it's also tying in with Marsha Gay Harden's character being kind of underwritten. Okay. Because we have the scene where Robin Williams, where, where Philip Brainerd is talking to Weebo and having a heart-to-heart, -heart, and he realizes why he is absent-minded. Okay. Do you remember why? Yes. It's I because do. he loves Sarah. So dang much. That's why. And he's like, it's the chemical reaction I have to feeling love for her. That's why I'm absent minded. Doesn't make any sense. And so basically, it's her fault that he has the symptoms of a traumatic brain injury. Because he loves her so much that he forgets that they're getting married today. Yep. And I believed it because he's amazing. Yeah. And oh, and remember, he, he had to Skype into their wedding at the end. Yes. Because he's working so hard he's working in the basement. So hard. Then Weebo feels bad for him. Again, 
Weibo feels bad, yes. but he created rubber. And Weibo goes to Sarah's house, wakes her up in the middle of the night, and plays her back the message. Oh, can I talk about my pet peeve? Well, I was going to say, plays her back the message, thus committing like your greatest pet peeve in, a, in all of movies. Top five pet peeves of all movies. If you as a moviegoer see a scene and it's shot with the movie camera, and then the idea is later in the movie someone was recording it and playing back the recording, but the recording is the movie camera. I, I hate that. Yes. I hate it so much. It just pisses me off. Yes. It takes me right out of it every single time. Yes. Um, I didn't think this movie would make me so angry. No. And it makes, I think one of the things that makes me so angry about is there's stuff in it that's genuinely good and funny. Right. Like you have an excellent Robin Williams performance that the movie fails to live up to. Yeah. And an excellent Ted Levine performance and Clancy Brown. The cast is really good. Yeah. But Weibo was a stupid choice. Yeah. I really firmly believe that Weibo was a stupid choice. And But anyway, Weibo goes to Sarah and plays her back the message of him saying all these things. And her reaction isn't, oh, I'm so glad he blames me for his problems with remembering things. Instead, she thinks, oh, I love him so much. We must get married. <sighs> It's no. pro- it just I, it just it bothers me. Well, on that happy note, do you want to wrap this up? Yeah, let's wrap this up. All right, let's do some quadrants. All right. So, do you think that John Hughes? I'm just gonna put this all on him. Do you yeah. think John Hughes cared about the original movie, The Absent-Minded Professor? I bet he did. I sh- I sure I sure agree with you. I bet he saw it as a kid. I bet it was a movie that he really liked. Like I feel like any proof that we need is the fact that it's the absent-minded professor. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not saying no one's heard of it. Right. But if you were to go to anyone and say, like, you can remake any movie. Like, he, this is a guy who remade The Miracle on 34th Street. Yes. That is a big, bona fide, everyone has seen it, quote unquote, everyone has seen it classic. Yes. The Absent-Minded Professor, though, that's like a minor classic. Yeah. I think it holds up. I bet there was a lot of love for that movie. I bet Robin Williams had a lot of love for that movie. Totally. I think we looked at it. He was like, I think he was like 10 or something like that when the original came out. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure this was a movie he saw when he was a kid. Yeah. Was it successful? (sighs) Ultimately, no. 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 I mean, the movie as a film, barring Robin Williams' performance, was really not successful. And even his excellent, heartfelt like giving a hundred percent performance, I feel like doesn't save it as a film. No, I don't think that the makers of this movie had the same attention to detail and energy mm. that like Robert Stevenson and Bill Walsh had, yeah. for example, because mm-hmm. I think way too much of this movie doesn't work. And the emotion and energy that is brought to it doesn't make those things work. Yeah. Even though Rob Williams, and I would argue a whole bunch of people are really good in this movie, mm-hmm. but I don't think it saves it. No. But the original super fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, both of them are actually kind of fun, but Fl- Flubber, like, it's just not that good. Yeah. Yep. And brought to you on Disney Plus. Yes, brought to you by Disney Plus. Hit us up. I can't promise that, especially now that we have a kid and it's a little harder to record, there may be a lot of episodes we do where they just happen to be like multiple versions <laughs> on Disney Plus. Like, let's just do that. <laughs> let's make things fine. much easier. Well, this has been Adapt Your Parish. If you'd like to find us online, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AdaptCast. And if you tweet about the show, don't forget to use the AdaptCast hashtag. You can join our groups on Facebook and Goodreads, and you can also find and follow me on Letterboxd. If you have anything to say that's longer than a tweet, you can always send an email to adapterparishcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, there are two great ways you can do it. First, tell a friend. Second, a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice would be greatly appreciated. Shut up, Wesley. Oh, there it is. He puts the lotion on his skin. <laughs> <laughs>